This is the Classic Auto Mall Podcast. Broadcast from the studios inside the Classic Auto Mall in Morgantown, Pennsylvania. Just one hour west of Philadelphia at Pennsylvania Turnpike Exit 298. Featuring nearly 1,000 classic, vintage, and barn find vehicles for sale under one climate-controlled roof. Now, here's your host, Classic Auto Mall president, and the man with all the toys, Stuart Howden. Well, well, well. It's Jan. It's it's the new year. It's new year. It's Happy New 2024. Year. 2024. Can you believe that? That's just hard to believe. We, uh, you know, it's it's funny. 2023. I mean, we we're pushing for sales. We're pushing for this. We're pushing for consignments. We're trying to beat our record. We're trying yeah. to. And then it just comes and it goes. And Gone. then we're like, uh, okay, now we can erase all that whole sheet. Yeah. And start, start over fresh. a whole new sheet because who cares what you did last year? <laughs> <laughs> we're worried about this year. This is, start all over again. start all over again. It was a monumental year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the reason I know that is because I keep my little cheat sheet in my pocket every day. Yes. And uh, this little cheat sheet tells me how many cars we sold and how many we consigned. And 1,219 cars we consigned this year. Last year, 1,216. Wow. <laughs> Very so, close. So it's Im- improving, growing yeah, every I, year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't. What percentage is three on twelve hundred and nineteen? Um, I got a D in math. Can't help you. You know, but it's amazing that it was that similar uh, over the year because there are mitigating factors that cause us not to get consignments: bad weather, um, you know, something going on in the world, people yeah. sick, um, holidays, different things like that. But yet, for them to be so close, and it wasn't because. January and January, January year to year was the same, and February year to year was the same. It was all over the place, mm-hmm. different. So, um, but it's a lot of cars. We have a lot of cars in here. You know how many cars we have in here? How yes. many? How right, many? Stuart? A thousand ninety-three. Wow! Wow! Yeah. That yeah. was that was about what it was last week, I think. Oh, wow. okay. <laughs> I mean, for, come, they come and go. Being a bummer. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was waiting for that eleven hundred. Eleven hundred. We did 11, hit eleven hundred, didn't we? I don't well, know. I think, I think it was ten ninety-three. I think a couple of weeks ago. All we right. Well, I know, I know so. the number went down this morning because about a 48 Chevy just pulled out of here. Yeah, so. was, we sold a 48 Chevy, so that would be one less here. And, <laughs> and then we've had a couple go out for repairs, things that happened just because of time and age. Sure. Some of these old cars just all of a sudden decided to, you know, it's there's no rhyme or reason when something fails on an old car. That's the problem is that you never mm-hmm. know. A car can be perfect today, and tomorrow you get in it, and there's something wrong that wasn't wrong yesterday. And oh. you think, well, what the heck happened? It's, it's Christmas true. Eve, took my car for a ride, yeah. C- couldn't get it out of first. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, mean, it's, uh, I don't know. To be clear, we don't do repairs here at Classic Automall. Correct. We ask that yeah. a lot. And, yeah. hey, do you have parts for 69 Chevy? <laughs> no, we, no don't. We, we don't. We don't do parts. We don't do parts, and <laughs> we don't uh, we we don't do repairs here because we're not set up for that. Um we, I mean, our guys know enough about cars to, you know, replace batteries. Uh, you know, the obvious stuff, uh, blinker fluid, uh, <laughs> things like that. Uh, but, but anything beyond that, right. I mean, it's. It, and the problem is, is that you run into so many liability issues because these are not our cars. If we owned the vehicles, then right. more than likely we would have a repair facility on on site. But when you don't own them. Uh, it just makes things better for everybody. And let somebody who's an expert at fixing, you know, we're experts at selling your mm-hmm. car. Let somebody who's an expert fixing your car do the fixing. And we can recommend people. Sure. You know, it's not that we don't know people around here that do that. Yep. Um, so, but, uh, yeah, what an amazing year. And uh, the weather has held up nicely, although uh, there's snow in the forecast. Of course, we do live in Pennsylvania. So. That's right. We, we're <laughs> hoping for some snow. We like driving in snow. <laughs> well, some of us do. <laughs> I like driving in snow, and you like driving in no, yeah, I don't know that everybody likes driving. We got big trucks. Yeah, we got big trucks coming in to take us to the Philly Auto Show. Okay, uh, next week. Uh, if you're listening to this on Saturday, uh, uh, January six, the sixth, mm-hmm. um, the Philly Auto Show starts next Friday. Uh, the twelfth is actually the black time. The thirteenth, I think, it opens to for business. But six ABC News mm-hmm. was here and did a whole segment on us. It's going to air on Saturday night, uh, January the thirteenth. Check your local listings. That's awesome. Like say, and yeah. it'll probably be on their website, too, on the 6ABC app, so yeah. you'll be able to That's it's right. the, the auto show preview. Yeah, it's the preview. And the reason they do it the day, the evening, you know, it's already been open for one full day. Uh, and and the reason they do that is they like to have some footage of the actual, that, that this year event, not just use last year's footage. But I can tell you that we were on the, the uh, uh, 6ABC preview show, or show, and it was amazing what it did for us. The first year we opened in 2018. And then we were on again in 2022. 
And then again, of course, this year. So uh, they filmed probably for three hours. <laughs> I was wow. I was worn out, <laughs> walking and talking. Which you know, I, I asked him. I said, you know, I, I'm sure you probably just didn't get enough footage because I, you know, was <laughs> so shy. <laughs> right, right. They're like, oh, okay. yeah, please shut up. Three hours. Or, or, or as my wife says, can you please just stop talking? <laughs> it, it's an editor's nightmare. They're gonna get yeah. Three I was gonna say that poor editor. Uh, yeah. Did he say that three or four different times? The same exact thing. Just get a shot of the car. Just. Show the car, you know, yeah. just mm-hmm. ignore him. Yeah, and it'll, it'll, and they'll boil it down to uh, like two minutes. Mm-hmm. I was on camera for uh, basically three full days doing an auction one time. And we, uh, I, I ended up, I think I was 10 seconds I was on the, uh, uh, actually on the show. And, and it was amazing that it was uh, that much <laughs> footage that they shot, yet they only used 10 seconds of it, which proves to you how much footage that they shoot or they prove to you that they just didn't want me on camera <laughs> <laughs> oh can't that's can't be the reason but hence the term the cutting room floor yeah, when they do the movies how much of actual film you know video is like okay well you just yeah. we don't use it but well, film we talked about director's cut the other day where mm-hmm. they have stuff that they use that they may not have used uh you know for for the actual movie because it was either too long or wasn't relevant or but there were some great scenes in certain movies that they cut out and probably in hindsight they probably wouldn't have um but uh well that's the creative process yes that is and you know i think that uh listen i leave it up to the experts you know if they think something's good and needs to stay in then i'm sure they'll do that and i'm sure they can you know it's funny you can make a person just to be about anything you want them to be if you film them all day long for three days Mm -hmm. You can make him the nicest guy in the world, or you can probably make him the biggest, you know what? Sure. In the world too. Now, yeah. Ozzy, Ozzy Osbourne said that they <laughs> that was reality. He yeah. said some of the other reality shows you see are contri- contrived. He said, sure. in fact, they decided they didn't want to do it anymore when the director started. Why don't you do this, right. Ozzy? No, 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 this is supposed to be reality. Yeah. Ozzy said he gave up uh, hallucinogenics when he had an hour long conversation with a horse. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, he said. I just read that the other day. It's yeah, funny. It's funny. I mean, you know, you think about a guy like Ozzy, who, like Keith Richards and Mick Jagger and those guys, how have they survived all these right. years of things that they did and and the lifestyle that they lived? I mean, they didn't eat worth a damn. They weren't healthy. They did drugs all the time. They drank all the time. They probably slept all day. Yeah. And how they survived? Maybe the rock and roll running around on the stage kept them, you know, sure. vibrant enough. I Fit, mean, yeah, I yeah. guess. Well, the energy from the audience, too, has got to be, I think it, yeah. it's just got to be yeah. incredible. I feel that here a little bit. The yeah, energy yeah, from the people watching Watching it. me, you know, <laughs> filming Looking for 6 ABC. Yeah, or That's even right. Or here, yeah, at the podcast. So, But uh, anyway, uh, thanks to the Pat Travers Band, our music for the uh, show. And um, man, oh, man. Where did we sell cars the last two weeks? Because we weren't here last week, right? What were we? Were we here last no, week? No, we weren't. We weren't. no. Oh, right. That's another skipped week. That's right. Yep. Another, another. You no, say it. Another best of. Uh huh. <laughs> best of week. Yeah. Another skipped week. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't affect your pay. Don't worry. All right. All right. Uh, so anyway, the last two weeks. That's good enough. We, we've only <laughs> we've only sold thirty cars. So oh what a, darn what a it! Oh, slow gosh. week. Yeah. Fifteen. Two weeks, thirty cars. What are we going to do? I tell you what. <clears throat> Walmart is going to be nervous. Uh, Cedarville, New Jersey, Williamsport, Pennsylvania, Jackson, New Jersey, Tacoma, Washington, Newark, Delaware, Redondo Beach, California, Lincoln University, Pennsylvania, that's weird, Lexington Park, Maryland, Jacksonville, Florida, Doylestown, Pennsylvania, Newtown, Pennsylvania, Fallbrook, California, Newmanstown, Pennsylvania, Indio, California, Deerfield Beach, Florida, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Indianola, Pennsylvania, Ridgefield, Connecticut, Newcastle, Pennsylvania, Point Pleasant, New Jersey, Hamster, Hure, Nalines, Belgium. Wow. Uh, Reading, Pennsylvania, Kokomo, Indiana, Cicero, Illinois, Chestertown, Maryland, Ooh. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Kansas City, Missouri, Griffith, Indiana, Lumberton, New Jersey, and Las Vegas, Nevada. No kidding. Nah. So that was uh, quite a few different places we sold those, right? Yeah, Bel- Sorry, Delaware. It's Newark. <laughs> Newark. 12, Sorry. About 12 states in a, a foreign country. In a foreign country? <clears throat> I may have missed some because I pulled out my uh, my uh, air thing <laughs> instead of my pen. Your air check. <laughs> Isn't it funny how amazing how technology has advanced so far in everything automotive, except for the air check, yeah, for, the, right. for the tire. They're still yeah. filled the same way. Now, you can check them you know, based on the computer on your screen on your dash. It'll tell you if you're low air pressure or the sensor or whatever. But you still have to fail with the old-fashioned way. There's yeah. a there's a very funny internet spoof or, or prank that uh, you know a girl comes out of the comes home and says, "Dad, I I they filled up my tires with winter air 
and it was 75 bucks. Is that, is that okay? And the father, you know, freaks right. out. And he goes, I don't care. How do they charge you for that winter air? And oh, it funny. goes around. It's pretty funny. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Well, you know, uh, there was uh, some of the old cars in the old days had a, a hose that ran from the spare in the trunk to the exterior of the car, and you can actually fill it without opening the trunk. Uh-huh. How cool is that? Yeah, that, that is cool. A, and of course, we don't have that now. I put air shocks on my Trans Am back in the day, and it had a little, <laughs> a little nozzle, nozzle yeah, 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 in the back, and it would go, st- yeah. Well, you cool. don't need that today on a lot of cars because they don't give you a spare. Yeah, that's, that's true. true. Yeah, you don't get a spare, so. <clears throat> uh, you gotta save that weight. I guess, are there no spares at all anymore? Do they even No, there's the, spares. They still do the little donut thing, right? There's no, the I had a the Nissan Leaf Electric, I had mm-hmm. no spare. And I, I hit a pothole and had a blowout. Right. Missed a gig. I was doing a, a radio gig right. and I missed the job. Had to get towed. A whole right. routine. It's like uh, from now on. It's like no, nah, I, I won't buy it if it doesn't have a spare. Some yeah. cars actually come with a full size spare as well. Still, and, yeah, and yeah. spend no extra rim. Too. Some of the trucks do as well. <clears throat> yeah, I that's know true. That. Yep, because exactly. they put them underneath the bed sure. or whatever. And uh, but a lot of a lot of people. That's interesting. You never think about stuff mm-hmm. like that until it's too late. And you know, you're driving down the road, and you know, it's like checking a lot of things on your car. You think you do, but maybe you don't. Maybe yeah. you've never even opened the trunk if you've owned your car for exactly. a short period. Yeah, of for time. sure. And I know that there's lots of people that own cars that never open the engine compartment. Mm-hmm. Can't right. do much under there anyway. It's like true. It used to be in the good. Well, you days. lose so much when you're buying it too, and then they have the the running joke of the guy that buys the truck and then gets home and it won't fit in the garage. Right. It's too long. Yeah, exactly. Or too well, wide. We get that question from people quite often on longer and larger cars, where they'll say, "Could you go and measure that car for me? Because I'm not certain it'll fit in my garage." They do. And, and if it doesn't fit in my garage, I'm not going to buy it. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and you, it's hard to argue with that. I yeah. Mean, you know, unless he's just you know. His garage is really bigger than he's saying. You know, it's 22 feet long and, you know, 18 feet no, wide. Some of, well, long, some of these long cars will That's rule it. number three of the four things you need to buy the car. Right, exactly. That's, that is the, the guy who wants that car, right. has the money to buy it, a place to put it, yeah. and a wife that'll let him have it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> You've got all those boxes not, checked. Not, one, not, one, one, miss it, one is missing, no sale. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have that happen quite often. You did what? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the guy calls back, oh, man. Better to what is it? Better to ask for ask forgiveness, forgiveness than, than ask for permission. That's right. Yeah, but that doesn't work in wife world. It may work in government regulations <laughs> and just speeding tickets, but uh, when it comes to your wife, I don't think that that is the good policy. At least that's what I've learned from my now third marriage. Yes, <laughs> your experience <laughs> and I'm very experienced. Secret radio code. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> I wonder what Thank that you. means. Mm. Oh, that means that we're going to take a break in 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. Wow. I didn't even get to any new the new inventory or any of that. I got so much stuff to talk about. I know. Here. we got to do two shows a week. We have to do two shows. No, oh, okay. Let's go. I don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't suggest that. Longer like show. That. I, although I do, I wouldn't mind doing some other types of shows. Yes. Here because we only use our studio one one hour out of a, what? how many hours in a week? 144 or something there are in a yeah. week or yeah. something like that. So it gets used. 162. W- one one sixty second. Uh, yeah. we we use this, so uh, maybe we could figure out a way to make this more uh, efficient and uh, uh, more usable. Yeah. Anyway, uh, when we return, we'll have a special guest uh, via Zoom, uh, Mr. Colin Comer, and uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes with the Classic Auto Mall podcast. Whether you want to buy or sell a classic collectible or special interest vehicle, you need to visit the Classic Auto Mall website for more information. If you're looking to buy, you can easily search our inventory of more than 1,000 vehicles on the web at ClassicAutoMall.com. And we're back with the Classic Auto Mall podcast from the Classic Auto Mall studio in Morgantown, Pennsylvania, with our dear friend Colin Comer on the Zoom camera, technology-based. My goodness, isn't it crazy that we can talk like this from many miles apart? It's wonderful, because I would never go to Pennsylvania. (laughs) Well, I would never go to uh, Wisconsin. That's where you live, right? Right. That's good. See, we're even. <laughs> we're even now. You're just north of Milwaukee, right? I'm actually in Milwaukee proper. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, then you must be close to a fantastic racing track there. Road America is right there, isn't it? Yeah. Elkhart Lake. Yep. How far yep. is that from you? It's 51 miles, and I know that because <laughs> I've worn ruts in the road going back and forth because uh, I'm up there about every weekend. Have you? Did you grow up in that part of the world? You've been there most of your life or all your life? I did. I, I grew up right here uh, you know, between Milwaukee and Elk Lake. Yeah, yeah, how fantastic. I grew up close to Road Atlanta, and it was, that was our home track, you know, it felt like anyway. And uh, it was always a lot of fun to go there and see all the different types of cars. To me, racing in the in the sports car level is much more fun to watch than the professional level anymore. It just seems a little bit too generic of everything you see. What's your thought on that? 
Yeah, I think the I think the amateur racing is fun. The vintage vintage racing, you know, I yeah. went from SCCA to vintage racing. So, um, you know, I've raced all over the world, but uh, the vintage racing, I think, is some of the best racing because, uh, yeah, like you said, the new the new modern uh, racing, organized, sanctioned stuff, you know, uh, with this balance of performance. You know, I don't want to say anything negative, but I, it gets a little boring when you see, you know, if if a car is a little bit faster, they knock him down so he's a little bit slower. It just doesn't seem <laughs> yeah. doesn't seem to be in the spirit of racing. Yeah, of course. Then you watch Max in Formula One, who just you know has a half second advantage, and you think, well, that's not very much until you do fifty two laps times half a second, and you're ahead by thirty seconds. <laughs> right, <laughs> it becomes yeah, exactly. not much of a race. I mean, I miss the old days of racing, and that is going to make me sound old, but uh, I miss the old days of you know the Mazdas that you cover covered your ears and the big right. thundering Chevys that made the sound and then the V12s and all the different thing. And like you said, vintage racing offers all that still. Yeah. And, and it's great because now again, we're going to sound old, but the stuff that we, that we loved that was, there were new cars racing when we were kind of in our prime, I guess. Sure. Uh, they're now vintage cars. Like <laughs> I race a vintage, uh, you know, vintage Trans Am car. It's a 1995. Wow. So <laughs> that's so like funny. a new car to me, but. <laughs> Has you got a cup holder in it? You got that? <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't have Bluetooth or a car player. I don't anything. know. How, I do you, how do you survive? You know, it's <laughs> funny though. Uh, you know, people wonder why race cars are all the same design, why new cars are all the same design, because all of the designers and engineers and aerodynamicists, if that's even a word, I don't know, um, all went to the same school and they're tri- striving for the same goal. So if you're creating a new minivan, then the design is probably going to look like every other guy's minivan because you're coming to the same conclusion of aerodynamics and fuel efficiency and yada, yada, yada. Same thing in racing. Right, right. Yeah, and, you know, there's the theories of racing, I think, were, were settled on a long time ago, you know, the principles and practices. But the one major improvement we've had over the past 30, 40, 50 years is safety. Absolutely. Um, we've, we've made it so less guys – die when they go out there which is good um you know we don't want anybody <laughs> no. killed for no reason yeah well so. i think we'll all agree to that agree to agree <laughs> yes right so so there there has been some benefit but really nothing's gotten faster since the no. 1960s you know exactly think about uh talladega the speed record that uh they set what is that is it a gtp car they set that corvette at talladega 240 miles an hour or something back in the day i hate when i bring up numbers that i have no idea what they are and then i'm stuck right. as, oh. and still talking about it so <laughs> but you know <clears throat> i mean they toned those cars way down the wing supercars from the day i i remember seeing a meme on facebook where it had a bugatti veyron and a and a, a plymouth superbird and the veyron said i can go 200 miles an hour and the plymouth superbird says that's cute you know, yeah. 1969 versus 2027. Have you driven a Veyron, by the way? I have. Really? I have. Wow. Yeah. How I, was I, that? Um, it was all right. I <laughs> like old cars. <laughs> you could tell we're jaded, but yeah, it was all right. It was, you know, it was. You just, know, I, I've 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 driven modern supercars. <laughs> I've had modern supercars, and at the end of the day, I kind of like stepping back in time. Yeah. When I get in the car. You know, I like to smell some raw fuel and, mm-hmm. you know, have loud pipes and, you know, have to work at it. I don't, I don't necessarily need power steering or power brakes. You know, I'd, you know, give me a 65 GT350 or a Cobra for yeah. a driver, a Ferrari Dino or any of that stuff. Yeah. It, it know. makes, you know, it's like knowing the lyrics to a hard rock song. Sometimes they're hard to pick out. And when you know them, you're like in the inside club. It's the same kind of way. And like, I'll never forget. Lee Cross, when he bought his new Ford GT, and he came down here to show it to me here. He's a Pennsylvanian, by the way. You probably know Lee. Um, I do. Yeah. Uh, probably did the GT350 tour, I'm guessing. Uh, yes. But anyway, Lee brought his brand new Ford GT down here a couple, three or four years ago. And uh, he, I said, you know, thank you so much for bringing this down for me to see it. And he said, see it? You're going to drive it. And I drove it, and he said to me, he turned to me while we were driving and said, is, you know, is that all you're going to do? I mean... <laughs> I was so nervous driving this thing because when it's not your vehicle, it's hard to really go 10 tenths or nine tenths or eight tenths or whatever it is. Uh, You know, people used to say how cool it is. You work for a guy and he's got all these cars. Yeah. But if I wreck it, I got to move to like Slovenia or something. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The new car, the new cars are so capable and limits are so high. And it's crazy for me, you know, to think that, and probably you as well, that, you know, anybody can, with a good credit score can walk into a showroom today and, and get 700 horsepower, 900 horsepower, a yeah. thousand horsepower, you know, without any training, you know, yeah. 
I remember going, you know, learning how to fly airplanes. Like you have to kind of work your way up right. and you have to get certified for a high perform. You have to get certified for high performance aircraft, sure. get certified for retractable gear, not in cars. No, you know, you just... can go from your minivan and say, I want a, a demon, uh, you know, one, one seven. Right. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Yeah. It's kind of like my marriages. I've learned how to, you know, I'm going up the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> that so but you know what's interesting i we've talked people out of buying cars for their 16 year old kids that were a demon or a hellcat or a you know a corvette z06 or whatever because the kid has no driving experience whatsoever and i don't feel comfortable selling and and it should be that way i don't need more government regulations in my life but there are certain things that you need to know how to do Right. Cause you don't, again, you don't want anybody to get hurt. And right. for, and for, you know, I've sold high performance cars for years and, you know, you always kind of ask somebody like, why do you want this? Right. And what are you going to do with it? <laughs> and if the answers aren't right, then you try to steer them to something that might be better for their use profile. Yep. Um, but you certainly don't want anybody getting hurt. And for years, my shop did, uh, you know, race car support. We did race car prep and it concerned me as gentlemen racers became more and more prevalent, you know, we had people racing with us that never raced before sure. and they could afford to buy a Can-Am car or a Trans-Am car. And I was always nervous setting them out on the track, you know, because yeah, everybody knows in theory how to drive a car, mm -hmm. but you don't know the quick decision-making needed to save it before it hurts you. Right. And we had one guy put a car end over end over end. Mm. When I was watching, I thought, I'm out of the race support business as of today. Right this moment. Yeah. And, and thankfully he was okay. Right. And I was out of the race support business because I didn't, yeah. it's like handing somebody a gun and saying, yeah, have fun. Yeah. Have fun. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry about how all the mechanics of all that stuff. Well, I can tell you that, you know, you, you look at a lot of these wealthy guys who came into wealth very early in their life. And maybe before that they had a little econo box car and all of a sudden they build a dot com company and get a check for a billion dollars. And what do they go do? They go buy you know, a new Ferrari. Well, they have no idea how to drive it. Right. <clears throat> no earthly. I mean, I grew up with 180 horsepower in my trans am and I thought I was king of the hill. I can't imagine if I had even 500 horsepower back then with the rudimentary brakes and steering and all the things we had. We wouldn't be here. No, we would not be here. And, you know, that's one of those things that uh, we'll have a, a debate later on of whether we should be here. Um, I, I understand that <clears throat> not only are you an author and a Concord judge, but you're a collector as well, too, and a dealer to some degree. We were laughing off air that uh, you, you, your claim to fame is you want to be the smallest collector car dealer in the world. <laughs> right, right. I which, like that. Which, which, which is 180 out from you, but that's, you know, that's okay. <laughs> there's a place for Walmart and there's a place for Saks Fifth Avenue and everything right. in between. Yeah. Do you, I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a recovering used car dealer. That's why I want to be small. Sure. But it's nice to know what you know, and it's nice to know your inventory and it's nice to thoroughly know your inventory. And when you don't, like I have guys will ask me about friends of mine who will come here. They'll ask me about a car, and I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know, and I feel terrible. It's like I should know this, but <clears throat> it's hard to know eleven hundred cars. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's hard to know a dozen. I mean, but most of the cars I sell, thankfully, come from my collection. When I change something up, I decide to you know buy a different car, or change directions, sure. or you know I've had one for six or seven years, and I decide it's time to sell it. So I'll throw it on my dealership website and somebody goes, well, how, how, how well do you know the car? Well, I put 20,000 miles on it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Pretty familiar with it, you know? So, um, you know, that, it, it, that plays into the being small. Well, and, and we get all the time, we'll get people who come and look at a car and they're not sure what they want. And you have to guide them in the right direction, as we talked about, and tell them the reasons that this is a good car and this isn't a good car. But my best compliment, and I'm sure the same for you, is the compliment we look for from a long distance buyer is the car was just a little bit nicer than you described. Right. If we get right. that, we're golden. Because if, if it's way nicer than we described, we left money on the table. And if it's not as nice as we described, then we lied to them. You know, <clears throat> in, yeah. in uncertain terms. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. For for years, I mean, when when we started selling cars remotely, um, you know, the internet became a thing, and I was, you know, an early adopter of of having a website and selling right. cars remotely. You know, before that, I was running ads in Hemmings and you know, sending people pictures, and they'd fly in and see the car. But then people started getting comfortable buying stuff online. Right. But we were selling cars. I was selling cars sight unseen. And people were very concerned. I said, listen, here's the deal. I'm going to put it in a truck. And I'm going to ship it to you. If you open the door and you roll the car out and drive around the block, if it doesn't look like I say it did, or if it's not better than I say it is, put it back in the truck, tell the driver to bring it back. It's like a boomerang. Yeah. How you easy know? is that? Right. And <laughs> never had one sent back. I did have one where 
a guy's wife called me and said, <laughs> she explained to me that something must be wrong because her husband didn't buy a car. I said, no, your husband bought the GTO. She goes, no, no, you don't understand. My husband did not buy this car. It's coming back. I said, well, that doesn't really meet the terms and conditions of the return policy. <laughs> your husband bought it. He signed the contract. Yeah. So you guys work that out on your own. I don't understand these guys that show up and call the next day and say, my wife says no. It's like, if you don't you know your wife well enough to know whether you can go and buy a car without her permission or not? And I say always ask for permission. It's way easier than anything else anymore. That's coming from three marriages, <laughs> right? <laughs> don't, you, don't you know about shadow accounts and offsite storage? <laughs> I can't even buy my wife a gift anymore because she'll be like, what's this on the credit card? Well, just don't mind what's on the daggum credit card. And then the worst is you got a phone that'll track you and people like couples are tracking each other. Why were you at the mall today? Why were you at the, you know, I think of places that I've been to in the past that I'm, you know, not typically proud of being there, <laughs> nor did I want my wife to know, uh, yeah. you know, That's so you give, you give your phone to your buddy for the night. <laughs> There you go. Your 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 sober buddy, the guy who doesn't drink or party or anything like that, right? What are you doing tonight? I'm going to balance my checkbook. Here, hold my phone for me. I had a friend. I lived in Auburn, Indiana, and I, oh, it's a long story. I won't even tell you. I worked for eBay Cruise back in the day, uh, and you know, funny stories about knowing. My dad always said the best business advice I can give you is know what people drive. So you're trying to get a hold of a CEO of a company, you can't get a hold of it, and you drive past the local diner, and there's his brand new Cadillac, and you know that. You pull in and say, well. Joe, how surprised! I can't believe I ran into you. I've been trying to get a hold of you. <laughs> so, anyway, when we return, we'll come back with uh, Colin Comer with the uh, uh, Classic Automobile Podcast. I forgot where we were. We'll see you in a couple minutes. If you'd like to know all the advantages of selling your car through consignment, the information is available on our website, so you can chat with a professional who can answer all your questions. It's easy, safe, and convenient. Plus, we sell worldwide. We're always adding new vehicles to our inventory, so make sure you check our website early and often. Subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on social media. And we're back with the Classic Auto Mall podcast from the Classic Auto Mall studios in Morgantown, Pennsylvania. Speaking to Colin Comer, uh, author, uh, Concord judge, uh, mechanic. You got you check all the boxes in Collector Car World, right? Yeah, I just made it up. <laughs> Cool, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Who's going to check? I had a guy I grew up with who said his family founded IHOP. Back in the day, how would you know? You had to go to the library and sift through 80,000 books to find out if they actually right. were the IHOP people or not. It turns out yeah. he, wasn't, he wasn't anything internet, to do with the IHOP. The, internet, the internet's really ruining my game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard. I remember there was telephone booths back in the day in college that had different sound effects inside the booth. So you'd be at a bar, you go in to call home, and it, and it would be Dr. Blair, Dr. paging Dr. Blair, or there would be all these sound effects that it would have in the phone booth so you could pretend like you were anywhere because you didn't wow. want to call in the middle of the bar on the payphone because they would know <laughs> that you were at the bar. <laughs> There's an app you need to create. I think so too. Some or somebody will grab it and steal it from us. All of our twelve listeners, you know, one of them is probably <laughs> right on this, right? But uh, so you started. When did you start in the classic car, special interest car business? Did it was this from birth or how long have you been doing it? Well, I started in the classic car business before they were classic cars. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm pretty old now. But I started. I was a paper boy, and there was a local shop garage. You know, when I was old school garages uh you know neighborhood garages that you we all had when we were kids and uh, i was their paper boy and i used to go deliver their paper and then hang out and look at the cars yeah. you know and one day the owner just said if you want a job just ask <laughs> and i said well yes sir i do and i went outside and threw all my newspapers in the dumpster <laughs> and i started working at the garage nice. so uh, i was uh you know 13 years old wow and uh you know i'd been restoring my own car uh, my, my dad, uh, let me purchase a car because he knew I was going to do it on my own anyway. So he figured that'd uh, buy him a couple of years, right? <laughs> Before you yeah, right. On the road. So just bought a, bought a car and was restoring it at home. So I knew enough to get in trouble and, uh, started working, doing body work. And, you know, this shop had a lot of muscle cars and it was, you know, GTO, Ram Air 4 cars and W30, wow. uh, 442s and Corvettes. And, a little ahead know, of the curve on knowing about that stuff back then, right? I mean, that was, yeah. a lot of people didn't realize that there was varying levels of options you could get on these Chevelles and 442s and things like that. Well, it's funny because I learned the hard way. You know, I learned when you replace an exhaust manifold gasket on like that Ram Air 4 GTO and you order exhaust manifold gaskets and they show up and they're square <laughs> and the ports on the head are round. <laughs> And then you realize that there's an alternate, you know, that, that there's a round port version. Right. And you 
started figuring it out. Right. So yeah, so I started doing that and then, uh, you know, went on and got a, you know, uh, mechanical engineering, went to school for that and, uh, thought I might be an architect and then decided I didn't want to be an architect. I like cars more and just, uh, went all in and, you know, open a restoration shop and, uh, you know, repair shop, restoration shop, right. and then kind of morphed into being a car dealer right. by, by accident. Sure. Sure. Well, like, probably yeah. like everybody. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, we all, we, I ended up in it just because it seemed like the path to go that I could still play with old cars. Um, and you know, the thing about it is I, I, I seemed, it seems to me that in within the hobby, the guys who started out in the restoration mechanical end of it are way more knowledgeable about classic cars than any other person, you know, any other path that you took to get to it. Um, I My thing was eBay Cruise back in the day. I went to work for them in the early 2000s and said, like you had a little epiphany with the online internet thing and said, whoa, wait a minute, this could be cool. I could do right. this. And, and I did consignment cars in my basement you know, a laptop and a cell phone, and I didn't have a dealer license. I didn't have anything. We were just selling other people's cars on eBay, and they were selling like crazy. And yeah. then, and then something went weird with eBay for a while, and now we still have listings on eBay, surprisingly, and and it still works for us for in some regards. Not quite what it used to be, though. Yeah, it was it was <clears throat> a drastic sea change when it went to to the internet. I mean, somebody asked me, you know, early on how the internet was working out for me, and I said I've. I said, I've already made over a million dollars just selling cars online. They said, really? I said, yeah, I don't have to go develop, develop photos and mail them anymore <laughs> yeah. because I'm saving a million dollars a year by not going to Walgreens 60 minute photo oh, and well, FedExing uh, guys pictures that just collected them and then never bought the car. Oh, and we still get those to this day. A guy will call up and has no way of communication other than you're going to have to mail me some eight by tens. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, mean, I didn't know you could still do, but I mean, I used to buy you know, the disposable cameras and sure. you shoot five cars and right. you take pictures of them and you mail off the pictures and yeah. you put a self-addressed stamped envelope and say, if you don't want the car, you don't like the car, just please send the pictures back. Right. I'll send them to the next guy. Yeah. 99.9% of the time, you never saw your pictures. Well, they, like you said, they were picture collectors. That's what they collected is that, you know, right. well, and I think what the internet has done is, you know, you, could you, could you do what we're doing today without the internet? Absolutely not. I mean, just to load, <clears throat> excuse me, a hundred pictures per listing on Hemmings or classiccars.com or any of those. When we used to manually have to load the pictures on there in the early days, it would take hours to do that. You know, remember, yeah. I remember we bought a Tiger Woods golf game. It was five megabytes. It took 19 hours to download. <laughs> so yeah, we've, we've come a little ways from there. <laughs> yeah. When you said AOL dial up and you try to <laughs> upload pictures to the early days of like a oh website my. or something. Unbelievable. Crazy. <clears throat> so, um, You've written how many books now? Six, five or six books you've written? I think eight. Eight? Wow. And yeah. and mostly Muscle Car or Shelby or a composite of the two? Has that kind of been your flavor? Yes. Uh, I've written, uh, I think, the All-American Muscle Car, uh, Million Dollar Muscle Car, and uh, there's one other Muscle Car book right. in there, and the rest of them are all Shelby books. I'm a big Shelby guy. Right. So um, I've written a number of books on the cars and the people of Shelby American um, and really dove deep into that world because um, I'm passionate about it. Sure. So, um, you know, I, I, it's more of a passion project in general to write books. Right. You know, you don't, you don't see uh, automotive authors flying private. So <laughs> yeah, uh, they don't have a G700, right? <laughs> right. This is not, it, it's, it's, I, I spend more on pictures for the books, you know, and photographers than I make in royalties, but sure. it's like the old uh, Sam Phillips, you know, Sun Records, when the musician asked him when he was going to see royalties, he said, first time you go to England, kid. <laughs> <laughs> I just read something about Sam Phillips sell, selling Elvis's contract to RCA, and I think he got $15,000 or something. And, yeah, wow. he killed it. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah he was, he was woo -hoo. well, how many cars have we sold back in the days that we, you know, if we could only have them back today, you know, uh, oh, <clears> just so many. What, uh, you know, and the Shelby thing is interesting because, you know, three or four books on arguably the same subject you know a you got to remember what you wrote in the other book and i guess and to not duplicate it in the next one and you got to find more information that's got to be it's not like people are just giving away information it's not that easy to do right well no the thing is when you write one book like my first shelby book was the complete book of shelby where i really endeavored to have every shelby project right. every car he ever did was in there you know the shelby can-am car the turbine cars sure. the 
you know, every car you ever did, Shelby Dodges, the Vipers, you know, all the obscure stuff was in there. Right. Uh, the Shelby Mexico, you know, every everything was in there. And it was more of like a encyclopedia, like a jumping off point for people. And the next one I did, you know, was the the Cobra 50 Years book, which, which really celebrated the history of the Cobra and the people and what the Cobra created and how it's still going strong today. Like some guys even have them as a backdrop. Right. Um, <laughs> I wonder so. where that came from. <laughs> But it's funny when you write a book and then all of a sudden you get phone calls and emails from people saying, you know, my dad did this for Shelby or I have right. all these pictures my uncle took. Right. And it's kind of, it's just, this kind of, or it just builds organically where all of a sudden you have people calling you and telling you. And I really was very, very fortunate to be able to befriend, you know, so many of the original Shelby employees, uh, many of them now gone, right. but um, you know, a lot, a lot of them became really close friends. Like Phil Remington was a, was a really close friend, kind of my hero. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, you get the stories right from the source and I always felt it was my duty to preserve that history and write it down and write sure. it down accurately. Like I would write a chapter and I would send it to Phil Remington's daughter. She would print it and give it to him and he would go and redline it oh, and, awesome. and send it back. Yeah. And, you know, and it was funny because he'd say, no, 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 <laughs> yes, never saw it this way, but you're right. Right. Oh, I love that. <laughs> but, you know, I hope you saved all those, too, because that, that's gold oh, yeah. right there. I mean, that's amazing yeah. stuff. You know, um, it's interesting. The same thing kind of has happened with Harry Hurst with his Glory Days of Racing on uh, Facebook, where all these people are just like congregating on this site and pictures are showing up that have never been seen before. And you, somebody's got to save all this stuff. Right. And it's, it, you know, the Henry Ford, they dig through archives and they find pictures like the last book I just did, which just came out uh, last year, late last year, um, 2022, I should say, right. uh, you know, Shelby American 60 years. I, I found, a, you know, the the uh, Miles Collier, you know, his his foundation had a ton of pictures, right. you know, the Henry Ford, you know, I've gotten really close with some of those guys and they're like, you know, we have some new pictures that have come up when we were digging through Bronco stuff, right. you know, with the new Bronco coming out. Oh, it's yeah. amazing how stuff just finds its way to the surface. Sure. And if you never saw before, there's a local photographer here in Milwaukee who's in, in his like, mid eighties, I think. And, you know, he said, Oh, you're doing a book on Cobras. I took a bunch of pictures at road America <laughs> and, and he has these amazing photos of the Shelby team rolling in 1963 oh. the road America 500. Like nobody's ever seen these. Right. Right. They gotta, I gotta put them in in a book. Yeah. So you have, there's another book. So you got to do another right. book, right? You can't, you have I'm no done. choice at this I'm, point. I'm done. <laughs> You're not done. I got to see the Simeon library, which is amazing down here close to us in Philly. Have you, yes. you've been to the Simeon? I'm certain yes. of. It's an amazing place. It really is. And to see the, the, the back workings of where Dr. Fred worked and did his research and marked and checked and put tabs here and there. And it was, oh, it was like being in, I don't know, Nirvana. I don't know how to describe it. It was just it was as cool being in there as it was being in the museum part of the the, the building. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and and he was a true enthusiast. <sighs> he he understood how cars work and what made cars important. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, just like Miles Collier. You know, the, these guys were there to preserve history and they're there, you know, making sure it 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 lives and it stays, you know. Yeah, uh, not messed with. You know, yeah. you don't want this this history being changed or erased. With right, thank thank God we're out of the restore everything phase. Exactly. Me, I'm a, I'm a hundred percent behind you on that. I I think that there are so many cars need to be. I love to see the Cobra Daytona in as race condition. That's brilliant. I mean, who yes. do, you know, most rich guys would just say, make it perfect. I want this. I want that. You know, that's resto mods, which is a whole nother subject of you know. We're, I, anyway, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're part of the hobby, whether we like it or not, you know, right, and, and right. it's, and it's a shame on some cars and other cars that didn't. I mean, I have a 68 Camaro convertible here on consignment with a six speed, uh, I mean, a six cylinder and a two speed power glide, you know, <laughs> and yeah. that's a perfect candidate for somebody to say, we're going to, we're going to change this. We're going to make this a resto mod. It's also a perfect candidate for somebody to buy for their 16 year old kid, exactly. father, son project, father, daughter project, mm -hmm. you know, nice, safe, dependable. Those things are bulletproof. Oh my God. Absolutely. I mean, somebody could have that car and be the coolest kid in high school <laughs> to drive something vintage. You yeah, know. exactly. Are there, are there still hidden Cobras and Shelby products that are not found that are sitting in barns or, or even significant ones that are missing and probably out there somewhere? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny it's getting, the numbers are getting smaller, but 
I've been fortunate enough to find so many, you know, hidden gems and barn finds. I hate to say barn finds because you're Shelby's in a garage. Right. <laughs> um, but, but they're still out there. And it's amazing. I mean, there, you know, there's still some original owners, um, wow. you know, one owner Cobras and stuff like that. They're, you know, like I said, the numbers are getting really small, Sure. Uh, but they're still around and still out there. And, you know, with any car, I mean, you can find, you can find anything, right. um, it, it and that's that's the thrill that that's oh, for me. Yeah. That's the hunt right there. Yeah. It's like you find something that hasn't been on the market, hasn't been restored, hasn't been messed with, and it's like, man, that that makes you wake up the next day and try to do it again. Yeah, well, I mean, some of the guys in the hobby are the ones who are, you know, I I call you know the luckiest ones in the hobby because they have made created something that people call them with these cars now. They don't put them out on the market. They call you know whoever the collector of the week or year is, and they say, hey we've got this car. You want it? You interested? You know, and it's click. Yes. You know, gone yeah. in a truck and trailer with cash and don't hesitate. Listen, if you right. got, if you got time, we'd love to have you on for the third segment. We've got plenty more to talk about if you've got a few more minutes. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll be back with the classic auto mall podcast in just a couple of minutes. If you'd like to know all the advantages of selling your car through consignment, the information is available on the classic auto mall website, or you can chat with a professional who can answer all of your questions. It's easy safe and convenient plus we sell worldwide and we're back with the classic automobile podcast from the classic automobile studio in morgantown pennsylvania don't forget to visit our website classicautomall.com you can sign up for our newsletter and all that fun stuff we're doing our third segment with uh, our friend colin comer and talking about all kinds of fun things in the hobby what was the car you lusted after when you were a kid what's the one that you said god i gotta have that car someday oh man there are so many of them but really i mean i i was a I kind of like Mustangs always. So right. I always wanted a GT350, a 65 GT350, because a Cobra just seemed completely unattainable. Like sure. you'd never touch one. And living in the Midwest where it's snow and ice half the year seemed kind of silly to have a car with no top. You know. <laughs> right. But you were yeah, practical you as a youngster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just, I get cold easily. <laughs> <laughs> Heated seats are the most brilliant. That's the one thing I would I wish I could put in all my classics and, and collectible cars is heated seats. It's the greatest invention ever. Yeah. But my problem is I like everything. Like right. I, I would read and study about cars and I, I could find, I can find the good in almost any car. Sure. Sure. You know, it's funny. We talk about that. We, when we bring a car in on consignment here, we, our goal is to start looking for everything that's wrong with it. And, and I've told the guys here recently, I said, why don't we celebrate the good too? You know, let's don't just look for the bad because I can't go to Walmart and pull up next to a Suburban and go, well, there's a little rust down there and a little body work down there. It's like, what? Yeah. I don't need some stranger's car and I'm critiquing it. Yeah. I never do that. <laughs> you will now that I've said it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Of course, because after, you know, whatever, after 30 some years of restoring cars, yeah. It's, you know, it, you get that eye and it just never leaves you alone. You know, it's amazing when people see a car from the 20 footers, as we call them, and they look beautiful and you hate to be the bearer of bad news. And even people that own cars and you say, did you see this mark here? And did you see this? And you see this orange peel? And it's like, no, they never saw it. And then we put it up on the lift and they go, oh, I've never seen underneath my car before. And that's not always yeah. a good thing, you know. Right. Which is why, you know, again, we were talking earlier about the Internet. It's really changed things where the the, you know, Minimum viable now to sell a car is 150 pictures, three or four videos. I mean, you really have to show the car. And sure. people are now accustomed to seeing that on, you know, bring a trailer or whatever. They look underneath the car and they wear the chassis shots. Right, you know, right. And, and they want to see it. They want to see the engine number. So it's really great that people are getting educated and being smart consumers and knowing what they're buying. Because then they can go to guys like us and say, hey, I want to see this. And we're, we're happy to answer the hard questions. Absolutely. Um, you know, because you got to believe, you know, if you have good product, you know, please ask away. Let me show you everything. We show everything and we tell everybody that we show the good, the bad, the ugly. So if you don't, if you, if you've got something to hide on your car, this is not the place to bring it because we're going to show the rust hole and we're going to show the leak and we're going to show this and we're going to show that. We try to show it in its purest sense uh, without any alteration and, and we still can miss things. You know, it's still stuff right. slipped through the cracks. And just because a car is going down the road in a cocoon, uh, doesn't mean it's not doing this the whole way to California. And when it gets to California, something came loose or something happened. Right. And that's hard right. to explain to a customer. Yeah. And in, in your world, in a consignment world, you know, somebody selling one car, right. you know, it might benefit them to lie about something, but it certainly doesn't benefit 
you or your dealership or your reputation yeah. to sell one bad car to help <laughs> some guy get fifteen hundred dollars more. Exactly. You know, tell the truth, and then mm. everybody leaves intact and feeling like they were treated fairly. Well, and you know, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, we'll ask. We'll start drilling down with the guy who says he's got a car that's matching numbers. And it'll finally come down to, well, how do you know that it's matching numbers? Well, the guy I bought it from told me it was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. and how did he know? Well, the guy he bought it from told him to. And sometimes it's not malicious. It's just no. ignorance or, you know, that may be a little harsh of a word. But, you know, it's just people didn't know. They don't know better. They don't know what to, how to search for the you know, the number on the, the, the brooch marks and the number on the block and all right. that stuff. And the auctioneer swore that it was the original engine, so the auctioneer would never lie. <laughs> yeah, of course not. I love the auction business, but there's so many things about it that crack me up, and especially back in the day when when Cruz and and those guys were going and Silver out on the West Coast, and you know they just they they were just well, you know, we thought it was that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right <laughs> they didn't know they knew about as much about cars as you and i know about unicorns and fairies you know i mean it's just it wasn't hey no yeah. i know a lot about unicorns uh, well hell, i i should have known that see i really didn't do my due diligence very well here gosh yeah. darn but it. the next day i mean the auction company the next day when the dust settles and you own the car <laughs> and you've written the check and you go to take it home and you find out something's wrong then the auction company can just hey we're just we're just the the conduit yep. we just helped you we facilitated a sale did you read all the stuff you know, yeah, so. exactly. So, and, and they can't inspect. They can't inspect four thousand cars and run through well, an auction. Meekum this week has got four thousand cars in Kissimmee. Yeah. Now, I, I, I didn't you do a collection of cars at Meekum one year and sell? I, yeah, I sold a bunch of my cars off at Meekum. Was that nerve? Was that nerve wracking? Yeah, it was really nerve wracking having them there, having people touch them. <laughs> Oh, yeah, because I love my cars. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just like slamming the door on an original paint car. You know, like using their hand on the door oh, panel. Oh, it's just yeah. yeah. I know, I know. They keep me off the floor here because you know the minute I see somebody, I, I'm likely to say something I probably shouldn't. So they just keep me in the back office with no windows. <laughs> Right, right. Just you got to stay back there and count the money. Got to count the money and do the spreadsheets, you know. So speaking of count the money, have you seen this museum that I keep hearing about out in Oregon? This amazing muscle car collection that's I think called the Brothers Collection or something. Have you seen this? Do you know about this? Yes, I. I, I know you can't say much if you do know. Well, no. I mean, I I've uh, been involved with putting some of the cars in there. Right. Um, they have exceptional, exceptional cars. Um, the guys putting it together have exceptional taste and knowledge. Um, so they really, they know they made a list that was like a sharpshooter sure. I and mean, they knew exactly <laughs> what they wanted. They down to the serial number, Wow! like we want this car right. because you know, and they know their stuff, like I said, better than almost anybody out there. So, um, those are, those are diligent and, and educated collectors and the museum is just mind-blowing yeah that's what i understand yeah it's not just it's not about quantity it's about quality you know we we joke it's quantity too <laughs> well it's that too them. yeah it's like it's a buffet quality. it's like a really yeah. good buffet you know right not only was it delicious i couldn't eat another bite <laughs> yeah but it, but it you know they've done a really good job at telling a story mm -hmm. uh the genesis of something like shelby cars i mean right. they have they have all the important ones right so it tells the story um, and it's great and do they set a limit on what they'll pay for something or do they just say whatever it takes to get that particular car i'm going to pay it i mean i know that's a little bit broad stroke but yeah the, i mean i guess from what i from what i've seen how they operate they know what stuff is worth and they're not foolish right um you know so they're i, I would say that they uh they've made an effort to be fair and get good cars they also can realize obviously like any of us i mean any collector out there can realize when a seller is unreasonable right. and out of touch with reality so you can't really buy a car where the seller is out of reality sure so. sure and do they have three of the four convertible trans ams of 69 is that what i read something crazy yeah they have right a number there? 69 trans am convertibles i don't know how many they have yeah, it was of them yeah but they have a, a significant they're they're more than their fair share <laughs> Yeah, I think I think Hemi Hemi E body convertibles and you know they're again they they fine tune down to super super rare low production mm -hmm. you know Hemi E body cars uh, Trans Am con sixty nine Trans Am convertibles Shelby oh, wow. cars yeah um, you know their their uh, premeditated collecting shows through in in their collection. Well, so. so many guys collect and you go in and they when they tell you you got to come see my collection and you go there and it's a 
hodgepodge of stuff and none of it makes sense and half of it's stuff that you think, why did you even do this? And, of course, you find out the timeline is where it happened. So when they first started collecting, they were buying 1940 four-door Chevy sedan in black. And then they're figuring it out as they go, you know. And then finally they start buying the good stuff, and then they start selling off the bottom, you know. Right. Yep. It's, it's, and you just fine tune. Sure. I mean, you fine tune all the way through. So uh, I've done the same thing. I'm sure you've done the same thing. You know, you just – you buy a car and it's a great one. And then you find one that's, that's more great. Yeah. More <laughs> you know, greater <laughs> or, or a better color or a nicer history or sure. whatever, something that speaks to you a little louder. I just, you, yeah. I just bought a, a, a 63 Grand Prix, red, red, uh, eight lug wheels, you know, 389 tri power. I mean, it was like, I, I don't know. That car just spoke to me. You know, it was one of those ones and I probably paid too much for it. And I don't really care. You know, if, yeah. if I sell yeah. it, I sell it. And if I don't, it's not the end of the world. Right. What's the, what's the joke? You just bought too soon. <laughs> yeah. I didn't buy, I didn't pay too much. I just bought too soon. Although I saw Alex Rosie from, uh, uh, Rosie brothers up in Allentown, Pennsylvania. I don't know if you know them, but he had the greatest line ever. And I wrote it down because I didn't want to forget it. And now I can't find it. He said, Oh, there is no perfect car. Only perfect representation of a car. <laughs> and <laughs> I thought good. that, but the Bruce Meyer quote is the best. Yes, that's the best one. The the only cry once. Yeah, buy the best and only yeah. cry once. That yeah. is brilliant. That is such, yeah. that, that tells you everything you need to know right there. And yes, do you pay too much money? Sure you do sometimes. But, you know, it's it's hard to put a value. People say, well, the price guide says this. And I say, well, go to a car, go, go to any auction and the most desirable car there with five guys bidding, and they haven't written down a number on their hand of how much they're going to pay. They're just not going to stop raising their hand until they own the car. Right. And in my experience, when you're like my collection, I try to have the best, you know, sure. like anybody, you try to have the best. And if you find the best example of something and you realize later that you passed it up for $10,000 or $20,000 because you had your limit, then it'll always be the one that got away. And you'll Absolutely. go to try to find a, a comparable car and you'll end up settling for something that's not as good. And you always kick yourself like, sure. I should have bought the blue one. I didn't really want red. Right. But I Whatever took a red because I wanted to, that car. And, oh, it, it, it's mind-boggling. Well, just read, like, Don't Wash Mine, the Kirk White's book. Uh, yes. Um, Man, you know, 340 mm Ferraris that they sold for nine grand and they were snicker. <laughs> oh, look at us. Look what we did. Yeah. You know? yeah. And, and, you know, and Phil Tegmeyer, who worked for him back in the day, is a good friend of ours and comes here all the time. And the stories he tells is just, it's, it, you know, it's like grabbing an old 1970 Hemmings and seeing, you know, a Lola T70 Mark III B for $2,500. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or a Daytona Coupe for $7,000. Or, yeah. you know, but Kirk, but Kirk White, I mean, you know, everything I learned about writing Hemmings ads, I learned from Kirk. So great. His, I, I want to grab, I want to find all his newsletters that he put out because they are some brilliant writing. And his book is yeah. amazing. Although my lap yeah. was sweating because it's so heavy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, he was, he was, he was a good friend and a good guy. And, you know, when I got to know him, you know, it, you know, he told me years ago when I, when we were still advertising the Hemmings, he said, how much more is it to take a full column? Right, right. Not I said, that. you're right. Yeah. At, at 11 cents a word or 15 <laughs> cents a word or whatever they charged you, <laughs> right. spend the extra 10 bucks right? and nobody misses your ad. That's exactly right. And Hemmings, surprisingly, is still around. It's still that yeah. thick and it's yeah. still relevant. And that's for the guys that don't have internet. That's right. And Old Cars Weekly is still around too. So Yes, from well. from Wisconsin. But you know, my problem is is there I have a stack of magazines that's like this tall and I get, you know, like Octane and Linkage and all the and in Sports Car Market, which I love, and I used to be an editor at Sports Car Market, right? Yeah, I wrote I wrote for Sports Car Market for uh, from two thousand four through twenty eighteen. Oh wow. Wow. What a for great magazine. The, for, for Sports Car Market. American car collector, uh, Corvette market, right? You know all the spinoffs too. Sure. So, of course, I do. I wrote this, hundreds of articles for them. This will make me sound old school when I miss the the hand, the, the covers that were paintings that they yes. used to do. That were all they were not hand painted, but they were a painting was the cover, and they were brilliant. And then, of course, when they went to more mainstream and wanted to be on newsstands before they were even on newsstands, they said, no, 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 you can't, you can't have an oil painting cover. You have right. to have a photograph right. of a car. You know, so. Yeah. Yeah. You get, but it, I mean, that, that was always the insider. Like that was, if you were in the know, you read SCM. Absolutely. You know, and, and Keith really did it great. Cause I, I was getting, when it was the Alfa Romeo market letter, right. I would fax it to you. 
Yeah. And it was so it was so different, so great because he would do an auction reporting and he would call cars out for being junk. Exactly. And he nobody else was doing that. Thing. Right. This is unvarnished. <laughs> like, you know, he'd call a car a freight pig. His his term <laughs> freight pig. I you love know, like, that term. <laughs> yeah. So and you know, and it's still to this day. I mean, you just gotta be you, Call a spade a spade. Absolutely, you know, like cars junk. They call it out. Absolutely. Listen, I got in a lot of I got in a lot of trouble doing that too. And I used to do the auction profiles, and I would point out the good and the bad of a car. And sometimes the guy who bought the car would call me up with yeah. a problem. I say, it's it's factual. Yeah. Like, sorry, I can't. I, yeah, I can't. You can't argue with it. Or the auction house when you go bopping in there and they go, <laughs> we don't like you anymore. <laughs> if our job is to educate people on why something sold for a lot or mm -hmm. why something sold for a you know, a little quote unquote, Sure. You, know, you have to tell them why, because otherwise people will compare it and say, I have a car just like that. Well, no, let's just make sure. Right. This is what this car was. Now examine your car. And then people learn. It's a teaching moment. Absolutely. And, and not, you know, you can go to sleep at night if you, if you know, you told the truth and you can sleep comfortably and sleep like a baby and all that good stuff. I'm going to try that. <laughs> Do that. Work on that. Okay. <laughs> Listen, thanks so much for being on the show, Colin. We really appreciate it. We'll see you, I'm sure, at some event somewhere soon. And uh, we'd love to have you back on again in the future. And we'll continue. I got three more pages of stuff to talk about. So. There you go. Anytime. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks a lot. Take care. We'll catch you next time on the Classic Auto Mall podcast. You've been listening to the Classic Auto Mall Podcast with your host, Stuart Howden. Executive producer, Steve Safir. Produced and engineered by yours truly, J.R. Russ. Thanks for listening and sharing the Classic Auto Mall Podcast. Available on ClassicAutoMall.com, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Music courtesy of the Pat Travers Band. Produced by Car Smarts Media. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved.